I was talking with uh, CJ about my message for tonight, and at first I thought, well, it's the beginning of the year, so maybe we should talk about, you know, our attitude toward the new year, the things that our frame of mind for the new year. But then as I got here, I, I was talking to CJ, and I said, you know, I, I am the family minister's director, and maybe you're expecting me to present something that has to do with marriage or with the family. And so I decided to, to change my message, and we will talk about marriage tonight. And some of you are single, and you're probably saying, oh, no, that doesn't apply to me. But if you listen, I think you would learn some things about being single and how to approach marriage in a biblical way. Now, some of the thoughts that I will take, uh, that I will share with you tonight have been taken from a book that I read recently by Dr. K uh, Timothy Keller. The name of the book is The Meaning of Marriage, and it opened my mind to a different view of, of looking at marriage in a different way, maybe I should say. So I want us to consider probably the two most significant passages in the New Testament that deal with marriage. I hope that you brought your Bibles, and uh, I hope that you have them handy because we're going to refer to these texts tonight. And the first one is found in Matthew chapter 19. Uh, you'll probably recognize that comes from the Gospel of Matthew. So these are the words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 19. And as I read this passage, as we read it together, I think you will recognize the story here. So Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 1 where uh, Matthew writes these words, Matthew chapter 19 and verse 1. Now, when Jesus finished these sayings, he left Galilee and went to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan River. Verse 2, large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And then some Pharisees came to him in order to test him. So they didn't come because they were interested in knowing more about Jesus because they really wanted to know what he wanted to tell them, but they wanted to test them. They wanted to check and see if, if, if what this guy would say and maybe if they would catch him in, 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 uh, in his words and, and maybe arrest him or have him stoned or, or, or killed in some way or another. So they came to test Jesus and they asked him these words. Or they asked him this question, is it, lawful, is it lawful to divorce a wife for any cause? Verse 4, he answered, have you not read that from the beginning the Creator made them male and female? And he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command us to give a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her? Jesus said to them, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of your hard hearts. But from the beginning, it was not this way. Now I say to you that whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another commits adultery. The disciple said to him, if this is the case of a husband with a wife, it's better not to marry. He said to them, not everyone can accept this statement except those to whom it has been given. For there are some eunuchs who were uh, that way from birth and some who were made eunuchs by others, and some who became eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who is able to accept this should accept it. Some of you probably have heard the statistics that are often quoted about divorce in the United States. You probably have heard that divorce in the United States is about 50%. And actually, that has been misinterpreted in many ways. When we say that the divorce in the United States is about 50%, some people will say what that means is that one out of every two couples that get married will end up in divorce. But that's not what that, mean, what that means. Uh, some people will say that when you marry, you have a 50% chance that you will get a divorce. But that is not what that means either. What that means is that uh, for instance, we are here in Montgomery County, Maryland. What that means is that if there are 1,000, let's say 1,000 marriages, 1,000 weddings in one year in Montgomery County, 
Montgomery County. They also record about 500 divorces in Montgomery County. That's how they figured the rate of divorce is about 50%. But doesn't mean that those 500 couples that are getting a divorce are among the 1,000 that were married. It's just that there are about 500 divorces for every 1,000 weddings that take place in one year in one specific area. Does that make sense? Okay. Nevertheless, the divorce rate is, in, in the United States, about 50%. Now, the interesting thing is that people still find marriage a desirable experience, an institution, a, a lifestyle that most people still want to be part of, that want to enter. You ask high schoolers who would think, uh, you know, they're not really interested in getting married, but no, actually high schoolers for the most part say, you know, ultimately I would like to also be married. Now what I would like us to do is to look at the passage that we just read because in it we find three principles that Jesus teaches about marriage. The first one is that, that marriage, or, or, or the, 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 what Jesus teaches in this passage is the essence of marriage. What is the essence of marriage? Uh, first, we need to understand what essence means. Uh, the essence of something is what, what it makes the thing what it is. For instance, if I were to ask you, and Dr. Keller asked these kinds of questions in his book, if I were to ask you, what is the essence of a doctor? Well, a doctor is one who wears a white coat. But that's not what makes a doctor a doctor. There are other people who wear white coats who are not doctors. Pharmacists sometimes wear white coats. Uh, other people, lab technicians, wear uh, white coats, but it doesn't make them a doctor. Uh, what is the essence of um, all, let's say, uh, what is the, the essence of of a pastor. What makes a pastor a pastor? Well, a pastor is someone who carries a Bible. Well, no, because a lot of people carry Bibles and they're not pastors. What makes marriage marriage? What is the essence of marriage? Well, some people would say the essence of marriage is affection. Well, if that were the case, you know, we, we came from visiting our younger daughter who lives in Joplin, Missouri. We spent some time with them during the Christmas season. And they have a dog, an, an Australian shepherd. Uh, they call him Joey. And that dog loves them, and they love the dog. But they're not married to each other. So affection is not the essence of marriage. In fact, that's why so many marriages fail, because people based their marriage, their relationship, on romantic love, what we call affection, romantic love. So then what is the essence of marriage? Is it procreation? Well, no, because rabbits also have children. So just having children doesn't mean that a couple is married. There are many who, who have children who are not married, and there, there are many who are married who don't have children. So what is the essence of marriage? Jesus said there in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 5, for this reason, or for this cause, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife. United to his wife. Now, if you have maybe the King James Version of the Bible, it will probably say something, and will cleave to his wife. Have you ever seen, seen that word? Will be cleaved to his wife. Will be joined to his wife. The essence of marriage is that it is a covenant. And, and it's not just a covenant between a man and a woman, but it's a covenant of a man and a woman before God. They make a covenant with God that we are going to live under your guidance, under your shadow, with your blessings until death do us part. It's a covenant. That's why some people who are living together would say, is it really important that we get married? That piece of paper, how is that going to change our relationship? Well, it's not the piece of paper. It's the commitment that we as husbands and wives make before God that makes a difference and makes that relationship the type of marriage that God designed for it to be. Amen? 
It means to make a public vow of commitment to God and to the person that you're marrying. That's what Ezekiel says God did with us there in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 8. He says, there I, then I passed by you again and, and saw that you had reached the age for love. I spread the cloak, my cloak over you, and covered your nakedness. I swore a solemn oath to you and entered into a covenant and cleaved to you declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. The essence of marriage is that it is a covenant. A covenant. It's not just a legal institution. It's not just a social institution. It is a covenant with God. Secondly, the second principle that Jesus teaches us there in Matthew chapter 19 is that marriage has a specific purpose. What is the purpose of marriage? The purpose of marriage is for companionship or friendship. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 4, uh, verse 4, Jesus answered, Have you not read that from the beginning the Creator made them male and female? And he said, verse 5, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and will be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. For this reason is explained by what came before. What is the reasoning? God made them male and female for companionship, for deep friendship, for that closeness that can only take place between a husband and a wife. Back in Genesis 2, we find the first, uh, uh, the first uh, words that were uh, about something that was not good. Now, you remember that from the beginning when, when God made the, the earth and all the things in, in the earth, every day he made something different, and at the end of the day he said, and it is it is good. You know, he made, light, he made the light the first day, and he looked at the light, and he said, ah, it's good. And then the next day, he separated the, the, uh, the heavens from the earth, if you want to say it, or the atmosphere above from the earth below, and he closed that second day, and he said, what? It's good. And he went on every day. It's good. It's good. It's good. Until the sixth day when he created Adam, and he said, it's not good. Now, he didn't say Adam wasn't good, but he said it's not good that Adam is alone. And he then created Eve to complete Adam, to cre complete the work of creation, so that then he could not only say it is good, but he said it is very good. So God creates Adam to complete uh, rather, Eve to complete Adam, to be his companion, to be his friend. Eve truly completed Adam. The two became truly one. When Adam saw Eve, he burst into poetry. In fact, the first poetry ever recorded in the history of humanity. He looked at Eve and he said, ah, there she is, flesh of my flesh and bones of my bones. He didn't just say, oh, there's a woman. He was just overjoyed to see this, this creature that didn't look like a horse, didn't look like a gorilla, didn't look like a bird, looked like him. And he said, she's not like me. She is me. Remember, she was taken from the side of Adam. He didn't say she is like me. She is me. Now, that's important as we come to Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll look at those verses here in a minute. So, the purpose of marriage is companionship, friendship. Remember the words from Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 9? Two people are better than one because they can enjoy a better benefit from their labor. Verse 10, for if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But pity the person who falls down and has no one to help him up. Furthermore, if two lie together, they can keep each other warm. But how can one person keep warm by himself? Verse 12, although an assailant may overpower one person who is alone, two would be able to withstand him. Moreover, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now, this is one of the reasons why Paul wrote not to be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. 
How can we truly, how can be, we be truly intimate with a person when we cannot share the most intimate part of our beings there is, which is our spirituality? Social scientists tell us that the most successful marriages are those in which the two partners are, have the most things in common. And if God, if our spirituality is that important to us, why would we marry someone for whom God, for whom spirituality is not that important? Surely, we will have some differences, but we need to have lots of things in common too. In our spirituality, our faith in the past accomplishments of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, our hopes, our dreams, and aspirations for the future, an eternal future, they're all those are critical ingredients in, in the success of a marriage, of a relationship. The essence of marriage is that it is a covenant. The purpose of marriage is relationship, companionship, friendship. And third, the priority of marriage is also stated in chapter 19 and verse 5 of Matthew. For there we read these words. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and, be, and will be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. For this reason. You see here, Jesus tells us about the priority of marriage. We learn about the essence of marriage, the purpose of marriage, and now the priority of marriage. Marriage, says Jesus, has priority over every other relationship in life. Not even the relationship with your parents can have a higher priority to that between you and your spouse. I met with the pastors of the Bangalore conference in August and told them these things. And many of them came back to me later and said, you don't understand how things work here in India. We have a responsibility to take care of our parents. They are the most important relationship we have in our lives. And I said, I respect the, in, the Indian culture. I respect your practice. But that's not what the Bible says. And we have to decide whether we follow culture or we follow God's word. God's word says that the most important relationship in our life is the relationship that we have with our spouse. Now, it doesn't mean that we neglect our parents. It doesn't mean that we don't honor our parents. It doesn't mean that we abandon our parents. But our parents' relationship, the relationship we have with our parents, can never take the place or be more important than the relationship we have with our spouse, according to Jesus. Would you agree? Marriage is the most fundamental relationship there is. In the Garden of Eden, God didn't create a parent and a child. In the Garden of Eden, God didn't create two people of the same gender. From the Garden, marriage is the most primal, the most powerful relationship there is. That's why it has been in Satan's crosshairs from the very beginning. His goal, his design has been to destroy marriage in every way possible, either by undermining it, attacking it, destroying it, compromising it, doing everything possible so that people will say marriage is not really that important. Satan doesn't like the Sabbath because it strengthens our relationship with God as it reminds us every week that he, God, is the maker, our heavenly creator, our heavenly father. And Satan doesn't like marriage because it illustrates the relationship that exists between Christ and his people, as we will see in a minute. Interesting, those two things, the Sabbath and marriage, created there during the first week of creation, have been and continue to be under Satan's attack to this day. We all would defend the Sabbath even if it costs our life. Do we defend our marriage the same way? Marriage. Marriage has 
uh, says Dr. Keller, has the power to set the course of everything else in your life. If your marriage is strong and healthy, you may be facing challenges in every other area of your life, but you can manage them. Your self-esteem is based on what the most important person in your life believes about you. That's how we, that, that's how we have either a healthy uh, self-esteem or a very weak, very sick self-esteem. We, are, uh, we value ourselves based on what the most important, important person in our life thinks of us. Who is the most important person in my life? In my case, it happens to be my wife. Whatever she thinks about me will determine my self-worth. If she thinks I am the best-looking and smartest person in the world, which I agree with, by the way, uh, if she thinks I'm the best-looking, smartest man in the world, it doesn't matter if the rest of the world thinks I'm stupid and ugly. She thinks I'm smart, and she thinks I'm good-looking, and that's all that really matters. On the other hand, the whole world can tell me I'm the smartest person in the world, but when I get home, my wife says, you are the stupidest person I know. My self-worth will be based on what she tells me and not what everybody else tells me. That's how powerful this relationship we call marriage is. Marriage has that power. Everything else in the world may be weak, but if your marriage is strong, you will move into the world in strength. On the other hand, if everything, is, if everything else in your life is well, but your marriage is not, you will move into the world in weakness. That's how powerful it is. But I want us to look at the second passage that I said is very significant, and that's Ephesians chapter 5. So let's go over there for a moment. Ephesians chapter 5. And we'll begin reading in verse 22. You'll probably remember this passage. It's a very well-known passage of the Bible. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, we're going to come back to those verses in just a minute. But I want us to look at the next few verses. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as, just as Christ also loved the church. Now, I want you to notice those words. Just as Christ what do they mean, just as Christ? In the same way, with the same power, with the same commitment, with the same love and desire that Christ loved the church. Now, I want you to think about those words because they are critically important in our marriage relationship. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Now, he goes on to say, this is, how, this is the reason that, God, that Christ gave himself for the church. Verse 26, that he, that he, that is Christ, that he might... See, if you have your Bibles open, you should be able to tell me the next word. That he might sanctify her and cleanse her. Now, I want, you to, I want us to stop here for a second and think about what Paul is saying. Christ loved his bride, the church, so much that he died for her in order to sanctify her. If I understand what Paul is writing here, Paul is saying, husbands, your role, your role, your mission is to sanctify your wives. Did you hear what I just said? Your mission, husbands, is to sanctify your wives. Now, some of you would say to me, now, wait a minute, Pastor. Sanctification, you know, the sanctification is what we call the process of getting ready for the second coming of Jesus. That's what we call that, right? 
You know, justification is what Jesus did at the cross. And the moment that I accept Jesus, immediately I'm justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. But then we have this process of preparation for the second coming of Jesus, which we call sanctification. And that work is not my work. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in me. And when Jesus comes, a third event takes place, what we call glorification, when this imperfect body is changed into perfection, when this immortal body is changing, uh, when this mortal body is changed into immortality. Right? We understand the three things: justification, sanctification, glorification. And so you would say to me, sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit, not of a husband. But Paul is saying, no, that is indeed the work. Is it possible that the Holy Spirit uses us as husbands and wives so that we help our spouse in the process of sanctification? I think that is the case. In fact, let me show you why I think. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And let's begin reading in verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 12. Now, if you know anything about 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul has a lot of advice for married couples and even for singles there. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 12, Paul says, But to the rest I, now the Lord, say, If any brother has a wife who does not believe... And she's willing to live with him, let him not divorce, uh, divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he's willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. Now notice verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. You see, Paul understands that we are the instruments of the Holy Spirit to sanctify our spouses, to help them prepare for the second coming of Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this. Husbands, can you say you're helping your wives in the process of sanctification while you are abusing her? I have to confess I was very shocked when I was in India in August and heard many stories of abuse taking place among Seventh-day Adventists in India. I heard, for instance, a young lady who came to us and said, you know, my mother-in-law abuses me on a regular basis because I didn't bring enough dowry. And so I asked, well, how much is enough? And she says, I don't know. Nobody knows. The mother-in-law decides how much is enough, and until it's enough, she has the right to abuse, and my husband, her son, has no right to say anything. A man came to us and said, Pastor, I need you to tell me how I can manage my wife because she's not a good Indian wife. She doesn't listen to me, so I have to beat her up. And I said, well, that's where your first mistake is because you should never touch that woman. She is a daughter of God. You are hitting, you are abusing, you are hurting God's daughter. I don't know if it's only in India. I hope it is, but I hope it stops there. But I hope that it doesn't happen here in the United States among Indians or among Hispanics or among Caucasians or among African Americans or, or among nobody. Because how can we say that we are helping our spouses in the process of sanctification while we abuse them, neglect them, treat them badly, when we don't show them the love that Christ showed his church? Are you with me? So let's go back to Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> Husbands, again, verse 25, just to make sure we follow the entire passage. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, 
that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Did you ever hear those words anywhere else before? Matthew 19 and Genesis chapter 1. Interesting, three times in the Bible, all in reference to that union we call marriage, all brought to the same conclusion. This is a great mystery, verse 32, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. So if I understand what Paul is saying to husbands is that our mission in marriage is to help our wives in the process of sanctification. And that goes for wives too. Your mission, ladies, in life is to help your husbands in the, uh, in the process of sanctification. The, the mission that God has set for us as husbands and wives is to help our spouse so that they will be ready for the soon coming of Jesus. Amen? So then let's go back to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, it doesn't say submit to your husbands because they are the Lord, but rather as to the Lord. If your husband treats you like Christ treats the church, then you can submit to him as to the Lord. You see, guys, you see, men, the reason why you should treat your wives lovingly like Christ treated the church or treats the church, because then it makes it easier for your wives to submit to you as to the Lord. If you're abusive, if you neglect your wife, if you don't treat her lovingly, she, she, she doesn't have to submit to you because you're not acting like the Lord. Are you with me? No tomatoes thrown yet, huh? It, this is serious. This is a very somber thing. Because sometimes we think that my role as a husband is to be the boss. To tell my wife and kids what to do and they are to obey me no matter what. But Paul says, no, your role is not to be the boss, but to be the servant. Because that's what Jesus did to his wife, the church. He gave himself for her. When we are willing to give ourselves for our wives and treat them lovingly and sacrificially like Jesus has done for his church, then it's easier for the wife to submit to the husband as to the Lord. Does that make sense? For the husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ... So let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. The condition again is if the husband acts like the Lord, Jesus Christ, then the wife must submit to the husband as to the Lord. But if the husband doesn't act like Christ, the wife does not have to submit to the husband. The words of Paul. You see, the principles of the Bible, at least in the New Testament, are very clear. The essence of marriage is that marriage is a covenant, a covenant between us and God. The purpose of marriage is companionship, that deep friendship that can only take place when we share every bit of intimacy with one another, spiritually, especially spiritual intimacy. 
the primacy or the priority of marriage is that marriage should, take, should be the most important relationship in our life, the most important relationship even than that which exists between us and our parents or between us and our children. And the fourth principle, the mission of marriage, is to help each other in the process of sanctification as we prepare for the soon coming of Jesus. As we begin this new year, 2013, I encourage you husbands to act the part of Jesus as servant leaders, sacrificially honoring, respecting, and helping your wives. I encourage you ladies to submit to your husbands if they act the part of the Lord so that together you will help each other in this process of sanctification. We pray that Jesus will return this year. Some of you believe it could happen. Some of you are not too sure if you even want it to happen. I pray Jesus will return this year. And if he does return, I pray that I will have done everything in my power to help my wife be ready for the soon coming of Jesus. By helping my wife, I'm helping my children be ready for the soon coming of Jesus. And when she does her part and helps me to be ready, then guess what? When Jesus comes back, we'll all be ready for the soon coming of Jesus and be able to enjoy eternity together. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? May God bless you as you apply these four principles to your marriage, to your family. The essence of marriage is that it's a covenant. The purpose of marriage, deep companionship. The primacy of marriage, that it's the most relationship uh, in your life. And the mission of marriage is the sanctification of your spouse. May God bless you as you move closer to the second coming of Jesus following these principles for him and for your family.